My name is Anya Spern. I work at the Centre for Disability Long Policy at NUI Galway and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our webinar this evening called Respecting the Rights of Persons with Disabilities During COVID-19. This is the fourth webinar in the series by uh, the Institute for Life Course and Society um, and which is being co-sponsored with the UNESCO Chairs at Penn State University. Uh, so just a wee bit of housekeeping at the start. Uh, from the outset, I want to note that the terms persons with disabilities and disabled people will be used interchangeably over the course of this session. Um, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is also a bit of a mouthful, so it might be shortened to the UNCRPD or just the CRPD. Uh, but we're talking about the same convention. So this evening we have five live speakers giving their contributions. We have Catalina Devandas Aguilar, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We have James Cawley and Peter Cairns from the Independent Living Movement of Ireland, or ILMI. We have Fiona Anderson, who is a mental health advocate, and Frank Honnity, who is a member of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. I should be able to see everyone. Uh, we also have two pre-recorded contributions from Maureen Ford and Dermot Lines at the National Platform of Self-Advocates. Uh, this is a live webinar which is being recorded and should be available um, on YouTube over the next couple of days. Please do send in your questions over the course of the session. My colleague Kleena is carefully monitoring the social media pages ready for your questions. And if there is a particular panellist you would like to direct your question to, please do include that. And we're going to try and get through as many of your questions and comments as possible. So just by way of introduction to today's topic, the Centre for Disability Law and Policy has been very concerned about the impact of COVID-19 on persons with disabilities. We're very grateful to our panellists this evening who are going to provide international and Irish perspectives on this issue. To put the seminar into context with the rest of the Living and Learning Empathy series at ILAS, we all know that empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. The COVID-19 pandemic has generated public sentiments that we are all experiencing this new way of life together. It's been great to see the willingness and creativity to develop different approaches to how we work, learn, play and interact with our communities. Unfortunately, this new way of life is not entirely new to many persons with disabilities. Social isolation, disruption to work and education and the lack of safely accessible public facilities are all issues with disability rights advocates have been trying to address for decades. Empathy should motivate all of us to move towards a more disability inclusive society in the aftermath of this pandemic. It's really evident from international and local reports that the crisis is having a disproportionate impact on persons with disabilities. Since early March, I've been doing research into the responses by other countries um, in relation to COVID, uh, particularly in disability residential settings. I've also been really pleased to engage with colleagues who are disability activists, um, our representative organisations and academics to draft a collaborative statement which has attracted nearly 30 signatures so far, um, which outlines the concerns for persons with disabilities in Ireland at this time. Um, many of which will be touched on today. While we know it is impossible to cover all issues in our hour-long webinar this evening, we've gathered perspectives across physical, intellectual and mental health disabilities, as well as a mix of urban and rural experiences. We also recognise that persons with disabilities have many other identities. They are men, women, children, parents, grandparents, siblings, members of the LGBTQI community, they belong to ethnic minorities, are stuck in the direct provision system, uh, and they also experience homelessness among many other identities. And these can all add layers of difficulties at this time. So to dig deeper into these issues, um, I'm going to turn first to our panellist, Catalina Devan Aguilar, to provide some information from her perspective as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Well, thank you very much and thanks for the invitation to the National University of Ireland in Galway. Uh, as you were saying, for me as an independent expert, it's important to highlight 
how this crisis got us uh, unprepared and how persons with disabilities have feel, I think, uh, all around the world that they have been left behind. Uh, the situation has been extremely difficult and extremely stressful. And what I would like to talk about today is about four things. Uh, first, of course, about the impact of the virus on persons with disabilities, so the direct impact. Uh, then the indirect impact, meaning about how persons with disabilities were affected by emergency measures, for instance, the lockdown. And also then to talk about and what next, right? How do we build better? What has been the response so far? And how do we uh, manage to get better responses and to make sure that when rebuilding or uh, recovering from this uh, crisis, we will do it in a way that is more inclusive for persons with disabilities. But as you were saying at the beginning, I think that although uh, the international community and the states for the last uh, 10, 12 years have been working more um, concretely and implementing the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and in trying to include persons with disabilities and their efforts, agendas and policy. Um, what we saw is that the foundations for this implementation of a rights-based perspective uh, or how to include persons with disabilities uh, from a human rights-based approach was not strong enough. The foundations were not strong enough. And so what we saw was that the emergency response was not inclusive of persons with disabilities from the onset. And persons with disabilities felt, as I said, that we were left behind. Uh, first of all, we were at greatest risk of uh, contracting the virus. And although there are the structural inequalities and discrimination against persons with disabilities, that's, that was not taken into consideration. And on the contrary, uh, the situation became worse, deepening the uh, pre-existing social and economic inequalities. So we are at greater risk of acquiring or contracting the virus uh, because of lack of information, for instance, and I think that we have seen how all around the world uh, the daily briefings from the governments are not accessible. They don't have, in many cases, sign language. There's very little efforts to include easy to read or uh, other ways to include persons with intellectual disabilities. Of course, we have barriers also on how to implement the protection measures. It's more difficult for some persons with disabilities to constantly wash their hands or to isolate and keep the physical distance that is required, especially for those that uh, require personal assistance and then the distancing, uh, it's impossible. Then there is, of course, a big risk on uh, institutions and places in which persons with disabilities receive uh, care. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And you mentioned that, of course, there is also more severe risks of not only acquiring the, the, the virus, but also of getting worse symptoms and even uh, dying. And this is not only because of the comorbidity that some persons with disabilities might have, but also because uh, our immune systems might be weaker, but due to poverty and due to institutionalization, for instance, uh, because many of these underlay, underlying health conditions might be because of poor health uh, outcomes, but cause of, uh, because of the health inequalities. Um, we are extremely concerned, as everybody, uh, with the data on the number of fatalities in institutions and in nursing homes where persons with disabilities are of course overrepresented uh, and this is something that we really need to problematize and hopefully it's going to help us to move forward and rethinking the way in which uh, we continue to provide support to persons with disabilities and another big issue uh, a, a great issue of concern was the whole issue of discrimination and accessing healthcare and how persons with disabilities for instance through the protocols of triage were uh, at some point in this pandemic uh, risking accessing uh, emergency healthcare services, the use of ventilators, how they were being sent no resuscitation forms um, so that they were not expected to receive the treatment that they needed in case that they got sick, right? And, and this was uh, an issue that continues to be an issue of concerns, but I think that was highlighted and some measures were taken on time but 
we received information that uh, persons with intellectual disabilities were being dismissed uh, in the emergency units, that they were not allowed to call for an ambulance, uh, and that they were told that they were not being able to stay at the hospital because they couldn't have the support that they needed to stay. On top of all of that, the emergency measures had a, a tremendous impact on persons with disabilities. The lockdowns, for instance, uh, it meant that the whole network of support for persons with disabilities was disrupted. In many countries, the support for persons with disabilities is provided in a very informal way. Um, so there was no data uh, of even a needs assessment of an understanding of what are the needs of persons with disabilities. So when the lockdown was in place, many of the support services, including personal assistance, was completely interrupted for many persons with disabilities. Not to mention that isolation is not easy to be managed by certain groups of persons with disabilities. The impact on education for children with disabilities and their lack of support to continue their learning process, even uh, through distance learning, uh, because of the lack of accessibility, because of the lack of uh, adequate methodologies to support them. Uh, the impact on social protection and how do we need to understand that for persons with disabilities that face graded levels of poverty is not easy to just uh, say, well, you, you can stockpile medicines or food or you can always have deliveries because we might not have the resources to do that and to get those services or those services might, again, not, not be accessible. And also there is a risk um, that is even greater for persons with disabilities that live in humanitarian settings with very little access to water and sanitation facilities, for instance, or access to healthcare. Uh, also, the, the regular services of healthcare, such as rehabilitation, uh, were interrupted for many persons with disabilities, and that is vital to keep them going. In this panorama, what now, right? Uh, the UN system uh, reacted a little bit late, I will say, but it reacted and, and we pushed uh, to have that reaction. So the World Health Organization issue uh, considerations to include persons with disabilities and COVID responses. Uh, there were some guidelines issue on social protection and what are the measures that are needed to uh, make sure that persons with disabilities are included. The Secretary General of the UN also uh, issued some uh, guidance and lately some states have started to react and also to uh, address and support the statements made by the UN. So but what, what next, right? Because we know that this is going to be, uh, we are going to have waves. Um, so we might be seeing that in Europe we are finalizing this, the first wave and so the lockdown measures uh, and the emergency measures are going to be released soon or are being released as we speak, uh, but we might encounter the challenges very soon again. And most importantly, what, what have we learned and how can we make sure that we build back, back better? One of the most important things for me and I have been insisting on that is how do we design policies that are inclusive for persons with disabilities? And we need to be more serious about that to confront discrimination and to make sure that persons with disabilities will not be left behind again, uh, we will need to make sure that persons with disabilities are included in all the mainstream policies and responses and all the recovery plans. Um, and this is important for national plans and for international plans and for international cooperation so that every effort that is going to be there to recover from this crisis is inclusive for persons, for persons with disabilities. And then also we might need to have a specific policies and a specific actions to include persons with disabilities. So we need a twin track approach. Of course, we will need to make sure that accessibility, it's a must. We cannot continue to move uh, ahead without making sure that everybody is understanding and is getting access to the information that is needed. So accessibility is a fundamental uh, step. We need to think about non-discrimination. Uh, the example of the triage was one of the greatest examples of how discrimination and ableism is affecting persons with disabilities. So any policy that we are going to be using to recover and to reconstruct and to build back better uh, should be based on the non-discrimination principle. 
Of course, we have to have active participation and consultation of persons with disabilities. Without that, the nothing about us without us is central. Persons with disabilities have not been consulted and sitting in the decision making tables during the crisis, and that is something we need to change. And lastly, we need to have accountability mechanisms. We need to make sure that there is a way to measure and to help governments and agencies and donors accountable for what they are doing. And for that, we need to have more data. We need to have more information on what is the situation of persons with disabilities. I know I don't have more time and, and it's, it's overwhelming because we need to look at very different sectorial areas. We need to think about what is needed in health, what is needed in social protection, what is needed to ensure support services, uh, what we need in education. But I would like to just problematize the issue of institutions and residential care and long-term care. Uh, the disability community has been very vocal for decades and decades about the dangers, the harm that institutionalization costs and the need to cost on people and the need to to trans uh, to to move towards uh, supported supported services in the community. So how do we get the support that we need in the community to live and to stay in the community? And this is something that uh, I believe we need to. Uh, this this crisis is helping us to reinforce that and to realize that we might need to discuss these issues further also with the older uh, people community to see how we can move together in redefining the way in which uh, long-term care is going to be provided. And hopefully we're going to be able to walk together towards a process of deinstitutionalization, closing segregated settings, and making sure that the support that is needed is provided in the community. It's very difficult because now the support is not in place and so for people that is facing this situation that has relatives that are in institutions, they may come to you and say, this is not sustainable. We cannot have it. We are not supported. So we really need to think about how are we going to support uh, people to stay in the community and um, to move away from uh, these terrible situations that we just witnessed during this crisis in the nursing homes and the residential long-term institutions. And with that, I end and I thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much, Kata. I know like 10 minutes is much too short a time to get all of your expertise to, to squeeze it all in. And I know that um, our other speakers will definitely be picking up on your points about institutionalization and the involvement of uh, disabled people in at decision making structures. Uh, so thank you very much for, for your comments so far. Uh, we're now going to hand over to uh, James Colley and Peter Cairns from the Independent Living Movement of Ireland. Um, and they'll talk about how ILMI um, has kind of adapted their work to respond to the current crisis. James joined ILMI in 2018 after a very successful teaching career. He is a board member of the European Anti-Poverty Network and has lectured on disability studies at Maynooth University. Uh, James is also a leader of his own personal assistance service, which allows him to live a life of choice, dignity and respect. Peter started work with the ILMI in 2019 as the Cross-Border Social Inclusion Project Coordinator. Uh, Peter also lectures at St. Angela's College in Sligo and has worked as an international disability consultant. So I'll hand over to James and Peter now. Thanks. Thanks, Anya. So I suppose I just want to say um, thank you to the Centre for Disability Law and Policy for inviting myself and Peter along here to this evening. Um, so firstly, I just want to give you a brief introduction to Independent Living Movement Ireland. So we are a cross impairment national disabled persons organisation um, or DPO. Um, and we are, as a DPO, seek to build an inclusive society for and with disabled people as experts and the voice of lived experience. And central to the way that we work in ILMI is that we effectively, uh, the effective proof of our work uh, through the social model of disability, which ensures that the policy decisions that impact on the lives of disabled people have to be in directly influenced by those whose lives are directly affected. So our philosophy then um, can be summed up as nothing about us without us or rights not charity. Um, as we all know, um, Ireland ratified the UNCRPD in 2018 and um, there are, are specific articles that refer to uh, relate to the roles of 
Disabled Persons Organisations or DPOs, Articles 4.3 and 29b. Um, and I suppose it's important to note as well that DPOs are separate from um, the disability service provider sector, which does not have a mandate to speak for or with disabled people. Um, ILMI is a DPO led by disabled people, um, and it is important for disabled people's contributions to be heard um, and recognised in the Irish policy development, but also um, internationally, nationally, um, regionally and locally, as we've heard Catalina speak about. Um, so I suppose that's just a brief introduction into um, who ILMI and, and our work. Uh, I'm going to pass you over to Peter Kearns now in relation to you know the how we've responded as an organisation um, to COVID-19. And then after, I'll briefly come back in, uh, I suppose, as a leader of a personal assistance service and, and talk about the issues that have impacted uh, leaders right across the country. Hi, James. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. And uh, as James says, we're going to touch on some of Catalina's points as well uh, to our, our presentation. So, uh, so just as, as James mentioned, uh, I, 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 I is uh, one of the few DPOs in Ireland. Uh, just uh, before I talk about the COVID 19 response, why I am I just like to emphasize that we do see we do recognize that uh, language and terms are quite valuable and quite evocative. And again Kathleen is touched on that. So in in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, uh, we have terms like uh, cocooning and uh, vulnerable. So uh, we obviously that that employs that today people are disempowered by uh, COVID 19 responses and language. So uh, I just like to say, say that a response in terms of COVID 19 uh, uh, activities online was due to say people are right and due to say to people a chance to question that uh, idea of. Uh, Vulnerable adults and cocooning, the idea that disabled, disabled people need, in the best interest, need to be safeguarded by the state. So, just uh, just uh, uh, in terms of the, the language, again, that as a DPO, we have respons responsibility to talk back to the state and, uh, and question the state's response to. COVID 19 and how, how, the, how the language takes our narrative to the, uh, to the crisis. But the crisis, uh, um, uh, eight weeks ago, the lockdown happened in, our, in the Republic of Ireland. Again, here in the North of Ireland, which is part of the UK, there was a different lockdown experience. And my, my colleagues in uh, Disability Action and uh, South to South. We're trying to cope with that difference. So, just in terms of uh, how we cope, how we cope with that, that uh, COVID nineteen response, and how that response reflects a uh, vision of disabled people uh, having uh, autonomy and choice in their daily life. So, I just want just want to go to to uh, some of the uh, how I have some points down here on. Uh, my, my, my old desktop here, and uh, I'm speaking to my, my laptop here. Uh, so, in terms of COVID-19 planning, yes, eight, nine weeks ago, we, we had a quick, a very quick turnaround. The uh, uh, independent living movement staff, we met, we met, we met a number of times over the last week, and quite quickly created a, a timetable of the Zoom uh, platform, video platform activities. Uh, we were very keen to give disabled people the voice to just just talk about the experience of, uh, of uh, isolation and, uh, and talk about well, also the crisis and opportunity that the COVID 19 day was. And it might seem quite, quite, uh, Cool, uh, quite cool, but uh, COVID 19 did give us as advocates the opportunity to 
organize and ed educate on an online basis. And as a lot of the day people, people are quite used to uh, experience, a little experience of isolation, we, we could, we could uh, uh, kick off quite quickly as a, as a disabled person's organization. Uh, again, like a lot, a lot of disabled people do uh, enjoy the disability sector and, and day centers, but uh, we do have to acknowledge that the, the disability sector in Ireland can be quite medical model and quite character model. And uh, I, yeah, as my colleague Jane said, uh, independent living movement, we work on the social model. And, and that not only in terms of as, a, as some kind of banal statement, we proof all our work and uh, all, all our activity to the social model. And myself, as an academic in, uh, in St. Andrews and Sligo, and it was part of an UIG, I, I, I see it as my, my job, my, my, I need to prove all the actions from a social world point of view. So it's not just something we say, it is definitely something we do. Well, so going back to the COVID-19 responses, uh, we set up a, a timetable of activities from Monday to Friday. And that included the... Uh, uh, an example would be had cognitive behavioural therapy, counselling, cognitive behavioural, CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy counselling, where the same people were shown exercise, uh, members and participants were shown exercises and, and shortcuts on how to cope with uh, the COVID-19 response. And, and they can learn on there for the last Six, seven weeks, and they will finish next week. And today, and, and today, like this afternoon, we had a, a former uh, independent living movement, a member, an actual member of the independent living movement, giving uh, 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 ter uh, therapy and counseling exercises as well to members. And then we also have, uh, uh, we also have a photography workshop where we're training, we're training members to use their mobile phones to record the, the, the COVID-19 experience. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're actually creating an online gallery, art gallery to, to launch that in July. We also have drawing classes where we have, we have an artist uh, working with members to, to draw still life based around objects found in the house that reflect the experience of COVID-19. And then uh, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, we have county-based Zoom where the activists and the uh, participants in our, in, our, in our IT project come together and they share they, they share ideas and experience, and we have guest speakers every day that are community now, our community now, but they will uh, source guest speakers every week for the county zone. And the great thing is that that's something we're going to keep on after the lockdown is gone. So a lot of these zoom based online activities, they're not just uh, a temporary response. We do see them as being a, quite a permanent response. And unlike going to a meeting trying to find an accessible hotel, now uh, members and participants are, are quite used to uh, using online Zoom collective, collective workshop and using games and exercises. So we don't, we, we know the future is that uh, we, we, we don't have to find always have uh, to find a test room we can do it online. So so uh, just to finish off my 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 section is uh, uh, just to identify in terms of the thing to do so the the uh, the, uh, the aim of the COVID nineteen uh, Zoom meeting every week we, we publish a timetable on, on Facebook participants emailed every week. Uh, so the aim was to identify 
So, you know, the opportunity to maintain society, explore methods, and uh, social model approaches to effective information and transformation, communicate and demonstrate collectively the solutions to COVID 19. So, unlike the term vulnerable or cocooning, our members are far from vulnerable and far, far from cocooning. They're actually quite active in all organizing uh, collective spaces in, uh, uh, in different counties. And I can say up here in North Northwest Ireland, uh, the local development companies, mainstream development co- companies, have copied some of our work the last few weeks uh, and are coming to us for the, the knowledge and experience on how to use uh, online responses to to COVID-19. So, so I just like to finish off by saying, uh, as I said, in terms of language and exchange, then we are DPO, social model is core to work about choice and time. So we, we, really, we are quite keen to challenge the idea of vulnerable or cocoon to say people. So, uh, so we, we, we see the, the, the pandemic as, as, a, as a crisis, but also as a, offering opportunities for disabled people to gather and organize and educate each other. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. James. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, so I know on your stuck for time, so I, I'll really go um, just really briefly through um some of the points so as peter mentioned there um you've heard talk about the effective use of online spaces um, and one that we've created as well is an online community for um leaders who are disabled people who use a personal assistance service and some of the issues identified um with them online uh, w- within that online community and um, that we hold weekly is around um information as well and around the lack of information um, and the lack of clarity around information for directing your personal assistance service, which varies across the CHO areas or the geographical areas of Ireland. So there, there was a lack of, of information around that. So ILMI has been calling for, you know, clear and consistent messages to be um, directed um, across um, the island of Ireland. And again, Kathleen has spoke about this as well, about social distancing, of course, is really, it's impossible for a leader and a PA when it's such a close um, relationship to, to carry out physical tasks, etc. Um, as a lot of leaders would say, extension of limbs, really. So the issue here is around the, the PPE and the global shortage. Um, so I suppose that has been a big issue. Also, I suppose in relation to we could talk about self-isolation at home around keeping your service, but also if you are um, required inpatient hospital care that, um, you know, a personal assistant need, needs to be there to maybe operate a hoist um, um, or even for those who need a PA for communication um, as well to direct their, their medical needs as well. And finally, I'll just finish up by saying that um, around um, the issue of your hours currently in, in the pandemic, but also post-pandemic, I suppose there's a real fear out there for leaders and um, disabled people having their personal assistance service that will they have their hours um, come after um, COVID-19 because let's face it, disabled people who have fought hard um, to get their, their, their hours, their personal assistance hours, we don't want to be um, reassessed. Um, and I suppose just to finish as well, our rights need to be respected, they need to be protected and fulfilled um, during and indeed after COVID-19. So I think we'll have a, hopefully um, opportunities as well to feed in um, um, and have um, evidence-based and, and real-life experiences in there and, and policies at all levels as well. That's great. Thanks very much, James and Peter, for really uh, interesting insights. Um, time is running against us. I don't know where this hour is going to. Um, so we're going to hand over now to Mairead Ford and Dermot Lyons. They have pre-recorded their contributions. Uh, they are both members of the National Platform of Self-Advocates, which represents adults with intellectual disabilities in Ireland. Um, and I spoke over the phone in the last few weeks to both Mairead and Dermot, um, and they've just told me a little bit about their lives kind of at the, the early stages of COVID. Um, so we'll hear from Mairead Ford first. I, I find the COVID-19 virus very hard because I live at home and I've, uh, my mother and my father, my son, but my mother and my father couldn't cocoon it because they're age over 70. And, um, and I miss my friends from the, from the service, but I do ring them, but it's still hard not to meet them anymore. The service is very good, all right, for updating us on, 
on what's happening, boss. Do you know? I still, do you know? Like, the job coach now rang us for the first two weeks when we were off. And that was lovely, do you know? But you still miss the staff and everything like that. I was talking to one friend there now at the weekend. And she is missing all the friends and going to work and everything like that. Missing the routine that we have. That's great. So we heard a wee bit from Marie. So we'll next hear from Dermot Lyons. He is a, a Leinster representative for the platform. And just for a little bit of context, Dermot lives in a residential setting. We came back on the Sunday night after being out with my sisters and I was told that I was on lockdown. So the pubs were closed and everything was closed. So then they said, oh, you can't go out. So I said one day, oh, hey, I'm going up to the shop to get my paper. So I went out five minutes up the road and five minutes back and then but what I'm missing is my friends and brands and going to the pub for a point going into the workshop and then I'm missing my job like you know because uh, it gets you out with, you know uh, leisure flex I walk in the pool pool area bowling area and I look after the pool tables and that so I'm missing that but that's on lockdown because you know so uh, then the uh, we just can't go to the doctor, you know, and get your prescriptions. You have to do it online. That was done by my boss, so that was it. And then uh, you can't really go out and meet people. I'm missing going out to my sister every Saturday and all that. I ring my sister every morning and ring my sister from Cork okay. every second day. So I ring a few friends that I have as well and ring them. Like it was seemingly that it was all about the old the senior citizens, but there was no mention of people living in residential with disability. And not time that we were mentioned a bit, it was only a five minute mm -hmm. like thing. So there should be more. Uh, there's some people living independently now and they can't go out either. Okay. So they have to keep in contact with their staff and only go up to the shop around their local area. They can't go to, to, too far away, you know. That's great. So we're really grateful to Mary and Dermot for the time for giving us those clips. Um, I think something that came up with Dermot was the lack of access to internet. So even though there might be lots of opportunities for many of us to stay in touch and get involved in lots of activities, um, that's not always an option for people in residential settings. And I think their conscience is also a real testament to how important like, the continued support and funding for disabled people's organisations, especially for people with intellectual disabilities in Ireland is, uh, given their unique ability and strengths in representing issues that are, are affecting them. Um, so I'll now turn over to Fiona Anderson. Um, Fiona is a mental health advocate and she's going to speak about the impact of COVID on mental health services. Um, Fiona is a graduate of the LLM at the Centre for Disability Law and Policy and has been involved in many projects and summer schools at the centre. Um, so Fiona, I'll hand over to you and ask you to, I know we're under pressure now for, for your 10 minute contribution. Thanks very much. Thank you, Anya, for the invitation to be here on the panel this evening. Whilst I use and quote stats, I am mindful that these are people and human beings I am talking about and are members of the marginalized spirit of society. Many people with a mental health disability may be completely unaware of underlying conditions and the need for regular general med medical health checks. As the Mental Health Commission was established to protect the rights of voluntary patients and they are the regulator conducting annual inspections of approved centres in Ireland, they have ceased inspections at the moment due to COVID-19 and ceased publishing inspection reports for 2019. I have looked at 43 facilities and the inspection reports for 2019 that are available. I have looked at General Regulation 19 specifically. In the mental health services, 63% of the centres have been non-compliant with aspects of the general medical checks. 
21% did not weigh residents, 42% did not measure the BMI, 42% did not measure the waist circumference, 35% did not conduct general health checks adequately, 19 centres percent did not choose glucose and HbA1c tests. An important factor is the next one, that 37% of them did not conduct nutritional status. And that's important in relation to underlying conditions such as maybe having diabetes. Uh, they did not record the smoking status in 28%. And 28% they didn't do the blood lipids. And in 6% six, six they didn't do medication reviews. And ECGs and prolactin tests. Um, they are given risk ratings for non-compliance. 12 centres had high risk ratings of 28%. And 13 had moderate risk ratings of 30%. You're wondering why this is, I'm doing this in relation to COVID-19. There's been a great emphasis put on obesity and, and the correlation with underlying conditions, i.e. diabetes. It comes across as very discriminatory and stigmatizing. There may be many reasons why a person has weight difficulties. Medical conditions such as for women sometimes PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome causes weight difficulties. The use of steroids, um, the use of psychotropic medications in the mental health services, for instance, lazapine or the trade name Zyprexa adds one third of weight to a person after commencement. The appetite mechanism fails, the, this means a person doesn't know when they are full and eat copious amounts of sugary and fatty foods which leads to the weight gain. This is a problem because it causes a high BMI obesity and possibly diabetes and potentially leads to cardiovascular disease. Olazapine Zyprexa aggravates diabetes and the combination of three antipsychotics combined causes heart problems. So it's important why all of these tests are done, the ECGs, the lipids and prolactin. Through COVID-19, there has been an increase in the months of February, March and April of involuntary admissions. 163 in February, 146 in March and April 168 in 2020 compared to 2019. The regrade from voluntary to involuntary patients for February 2020 was 42. From March 2020 was 40 and April 2020, 37. And an increase in February 2020 compared to February 2019. Revocation before a hearing by the responsible consultant psychiatrist in February 2020 was 126. In February 19, it was 127. And in March 2020, 153, 133 in 2019, and 143 in April 2009. We wrote that hearing February 2020, 16, 18 in February 2019, March 2015, 23 in 28 were revoked in 2019. Hearings held 
174 in February, 126 in February 2019, 178 in 2019 and 192 April 2020, 143 and that's that part. As of Friday, Monday, May the 15th, 17 deaths of residents have occurred in MH services, an increase of one since last week. 46 services out of 188 are reporting suspected or confirmed cases, 45 the previous week. 72 suspected or confirmed cases relating to residents, 81 the previous week, and 38 of these 72 cases are confirmed. 129 suspected or confirmed cases relating to staff. 90 of these 133 cases have been confined, confirmed 82 the previous week. Great, Fiona, so we're seeing that there's a lot of, um, there's definitely a lot of cases within mental health settings um, which aren't kind of being inspected. Would you agree with that? Yes. Can you just rephrase that for me? I was distracted. Yeah, no, just that there's been uh, kind of increases in, in cases of COVID within mental health residential settings, uh, which is a bit higher than what we're seeing in the general population. Yes, that's correct. Um, yeah. So we're just we're running out of time, and I do want to give Frank a little bit of time to speak as well. Um, so Frank, yeah. uh, thank you very much Fiona for uh, those statistics. Um, it's always really difficult to get data, we're always crying out for data. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, Frank, I'll hand over to you now. Frank is a member of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission since 2013 and he's also the Chair of the Disability Advisory Committee at IREC. Good evening. I'm very pleased to be here to represent the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, Ireland's national human rights institution and equality body, and to participate in this discussion. We have already heard some of the acute impacts of the COVID-19 crisis on people with disabilities. Since the outbreak, the Commission has focused its ongoing work on consideration of the human rights and equality implications of the crisis and the state's response. The Commission last year established a Disability Advisory Committee made up of 11 independent disability experts that assist and advise the Commission in our forthcoming formal role as the Article 33 independent monitoring mechanism under the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. I'm the current chair of this committee and we have been actively monitoring the impact of the crisis on persons with disability and the committee has informed the Commission of the many issues arising. Issues that have surfaced and are of concern to the Commission are wide ranging and point up the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 factors on people with disabilities. Many have been highlighted by those presenting earlier this evening, but some are worth reiterating. The discourse associating disabled persons with vulnerability and the risk of this leading to a reversion in understanding and perception of disability to a medical model, something we had thought had been confined to the past. Accessibility issues concerning public health information, healthcare services for COVID-19, COVID testing and treatment, in particular, the triage of acute health access and amended practices that directly or indirectly discriminate. The spread of the virus in congregated settings and the increased risk associated with being isolated in such settings, or indeed when having to self-isolate in the community, risks to mental health and increased risks of abuse and neglect. The particular risk faced by deaf and disabled travelers in inadequate living conditions with limited access to water and toilet. Disruptions to support such as personal assistance services and the suspension of critical day services and schooling. Risk of poverty for people with disabilities who may be disproportionately affected by the economic impacts of COVID-19 and who face extra costs and, un and unnecessary items, such as PPE for themselves, their carers, or personal assistance. The Commission has spoken out publicly on these issues in a series of letters to the government and in the media. Indeed, it was welcoming to see 
the publication by the Department of Health of the clarification in the context of people with disabilities of the state's recently published policy documents on ethical considerations raised by the response to the pandemic, in particular acute healthcare triage. The Commission continues to examine these policy statements and is actively engaging on issues of concern that remain. As we move into a phase where it's clear we are going to be living with the threat of this virus for some time, it is critical that the principle of equality and the dignity afforded by human rights are central to efforts to keep people safe and healthy. To ensure the needs of groups at particular risk of human, of human rights infringements are taken into account in the state's response, the Commission has recommended the establishment of a new mechanism to provide close parliamentary oversight of the implementation of emergency legislation and the equality and human rights implications of COVID-19. Specifically, the Commission recommended the most appropriate mechanism would be a parliamentary and a Roctus Committee on Human Rights, Equality and Diversity, which would have the requisite cross-departmental mandate to examine the legal, social and economic rights implications of COVID-19. The Oireachtas has since established a special COVID-19 committee to consider and take advice on the state's response to the, to the pandemic. The committee includes representation of all parties and political groups in the Oireachtas and have power to receive evidence and submissions, compel ministers and public officials to attend, examine and propose legislation. The Commission sees this committee as a key mechanism for providing oversight and accountability of the state response to the crisis and raising issues at government level. We do expect changes in timelines for Ireland's upcoming reviews of international human rights monitoring bodies, including the UN Human Rights Council and the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. And this will impact on our disability rights work in these contexts. We will nevertheless be actively monitoring and responding to the state's first report on the UN CRPD Committee, to the UN CRPD Committee, which is expected later this year. Separately, as negotiations are underway to establish our next government, the Commission has written individually to the leaders of each of the political parties to urge them to ensure that human rights and equality are central to the programme for government. We have asked that the next government prioritise the commencement, reform and enactment as appropriate of legislation which supports actions to bring Ireland into compliance with the CRPD. The Commission is advocating for the response to COVID-19 to be disability inclusive and respectful of disability rights. Central to securing this will be the state's active engagement with its responsibilities under the UN CRPD and IREC as the expected designated independent monitoring mechanism will play a central role. We are cognizant of the commitments set out in the state's midterm review of the national disability inclusion strategy in relation to the state's coordinating mechanism and meeting its responsibilities to consult with disabled persons organizations, people with disabilities and representatives under Article 4.3 of the Convention. IREC would be actively pressing on the realization of those commitments and we see this as absolutely crucial and central. The public sector equality and human rights duty as set out under legislation puts equality and human rights in the mainstream of how public bodies execute their functions. If public bodies engage with this duty in terms of how it applies to people with disabilities as users of the services and as members of their staff, every public body would be better prepared to protect, to protect disability rights in the case of future pan pa pandemics or other crises. It remains to be seen how the pandemic might impact the public sector and disability inclusive services in the long term. The Commission, however, will continue to monitor such human rights and equality issues in the transition out of the emergency as part of its work to encourage and support public bodies in meeting the public uh, sector, sorry, the public sector equality and human rights duty. The Commission is also actively engaged at a European and international level, liaising with our colleagues in Europe and uh, internationally, monitoring what we see happening across Europe and looking at practices in other jurisdictions and taking them into our own considerations in terms of how we see things domestically. I will finish by emphasizing once again that the rights of persons with disability must be central to both the immediate public health response and the longer term recovery from the crisis. Persons with disabilities and their representative organizations are best placed to inform a disability inclusive response. 
their right to participate in decision-making processes must be ensured. The public health emergency has emphasized the inadequacies of institutional settings and the corresponding need to implement fully the right to live independently in the community with adequate supports and measures to mitigate the risks of isolation. The Commission believes Ireland's response to COVID-19 recovery will determine the quality of our democracy and our society, not just during this crisis, but in the aftermath. And as James and Peter have said, there are opportunities to learn and move forward positively. The Commission, while having restructured its own working practices in response to the public health directives, is very much open and active. We are listening, monitoring, and where appropriate, providing assistance and taking action. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Frank. It's great to see that IUEC are kind of so on top of the, the disability brief. Um, we've been really tight on time. I've got one question that I'm going to direct to Kata, if that's okay. Um, and if you can provide a very kind of a, a summarised answer. Have you seen any examples of like remote working and assistive technology in countries with lower socioeconomic statuses? You know, what are the challenges or what's been working there? Yes, thank you very much. Um, we, uh, the, the use of assistive technology, I think, is of course fundamental to guarantee the participation of many persons with disabilities. Um, how we are using it is still remain a challenge. I do think that at this point, not everybody is having access, and more. Um, I will raise the concern that internationally we are hearing that some states are considering. Uh, to cut funds uh, that goes to this kind of technology because they want to read the COVID response. And that's why I want to insist on the need to make sure that everything that is done for the recovery needs to be inclusive of persons with disabilities. And that means ass assistive technology, that means the continuation of the support services, the continuation of uh, other services that are vital for persons with disabilities. One thing that I would like to highlight is that when we talk about technology, and this is not the case of assistive technology, but in many cases, people is now thinking of how we can work remotely, right? This has been the new discovery of the COVID crisis. Telework uh, is one of it, uh, remote education or learning education. And although this might be very important for some groups of persons with disabilities, we have to be very careful. This is not the silver lining that is going to solve all the issues of participation and inclusion of persons with disabilities. We need to make sure that uh, the use of any form of technology is not going to leave us in more isolation or uh, in uh, be in less included and with less possibilities of participating in the community, right? So, of course, on the one hand, we really need to make sure that the technology is available, that assistive technology and means of communications are accessible for all and to make sure that those are more and more uh, used, uh, also to communicate by the states that they are using those uh, technologies uh, and providing those technologies for people to be able to uh, communicate and to participate, but also be clear that um, we need to be uh, aware of the use of uh, technology broadly as a way to include persons with disabilities because it might not work and we are concerned about children with intellectual disabilities uh, in school, for instance. Uh, I wasn't sure if I got uh, the question right, but uh, if you need to clarify that for me. No, that's great. Thank you so much. So we're just coming up to seven o'clock. Um, I know just listening to you all, we could have spoken for another hour, if not longer, but we do have to draw to a close. Um, so I just want to thank everyone, um, all the panellists on screen and off screen, Marie and Dermot as well, of course. Thank you to our support behind the scenes, uh, Kleena and Dave and Joe. And just to highlight for next week's webinar, the UNESCO Child and Family Research Centre will be hosting a live discussion with representatives of Football Barcelona or Barcelona Football Club Foundation and the GAA in Ireland to explore sports role as a tool in supporting society beyond the first wave of the coronavirus crisis. Um, so something to look forward to for next week if you've been missing your sport fix. Um, so for now, thank you very much for myself uh, from Centre Disability Law and Policy and the Institute for Life Course and Society at Large. Thanks very much. <laughs>